In my last video on the research roadmap, a lot of you asked one very specific question. How do I break into frontier AI research before a master's or a PhD? Today, I want to talk about AI residency programs, specifically Google DeepMind's pre-doctoral researcher program, which I was a part of. This program has produced researchers behind ideas like chain of thought prompting and many others who are now senior researchers in frontier AI labs working on Gemini and ChatGPT. And a lot of AI residents are also doing PhDs at top programs like MIT and Stanford. In this video, I'll explain what the AI residency program really is, why you should consider it, and how the application and the screening process works. And at the end, I'll show you what my resume looked like when I got it. Most of what I say today applies directly to Google DeepMind's pre-doctoral researcher program. Historically, this was known as Google AI residency. It was a full-time research role, not an internship. And the difference is that you must have already been graduated either from your undergraduate or a master's program before applying. Some extremely influential work came out of this program. For example, Jason V, one of the leading authors behind Chain of Thought Prompting, did that work during his time as an AI resident at Google Brain. After Google Brain merged with Google DeepMind, the program was discontinued, but the idea behind the program still remains, and it now exists as the pre-doctoral researcher program at Google DeepMind India which is the role I was in before joining the Gemini team as a research engineer. The motivation behind this program is important to understand. Unlike software engineering roles, research roles are far fewer. Even large LLM companies only have a few thousand researchers globally, and full-time research headcounts are rare. So instead of hiring a large number of junior researchers permanently, companies run AI residency or pre doc programs, which are fixed-time roles. You conceptually work full-time where you work directly with DeepMind researchers, you publish in strong venues and also get a chance to contribute to frontier AI models like Gemini. This program was extremely valuable, at least for me, for several reasons. You get to work with world-class researchers, you collaborate daily with research scientists and engineers who are actively building systems like Gemini. You're not just reading papers in isolation, you're part of the process that produces them. You get hands-on experience with production-scale ML infrastructure, which is quite advanced in Frontier Labs. This is very different from training models on a single GPU or on just academic clusters. You also get an idea of how research translates into real products, what scales, what breaks, and what trade-offs matter. And this perspective is extremely valuable and extremely rare in a research career at such an early stage. If you're planning to apply for a PhD, this program massively de-risks your application you leave with publications, really strong recommendation letters, and importantly, you get a clarity on whether you actually enjoy doing research. You also leave with very high credibility, which helps you look for research opportunities after your pre-doc program. If by now you're thinking this program might be right for you, let's dive into the application process and the screening process for this. The application is straightforward. You apply through Google Careers on the pre-doctoral researcher role. This is open till Jan 5, 2026. And for this, you require a resume and your transcript. In your resume, you have two important asks. One is the research work, and the other is a statement of purpose. In the research work, include your publications, research projects, and importantly, mention references. These references can be professors or industry researchers who you've worked with, collaborated with, or your advisors during your internship. It's completely fine if you don't have accepted papers yet. You can include papers under review uh, and just mention clearly in the brackets it's under review. You can also include workshop papers or preprints and all of these really count. In addition, any tangible evidence of research, uh, research skill matters. This includes open source code, um, research repositories where you have reproducible projects, and even blocks where you explain uh, a method deeply and rigorously. It's important to highlight in this section that you're capable of doing research and you've demonstrated research experience in the past. You're also asked to submit a statement of purpose limited to 500 words. This is intentional because they want you to be crisp and they want to directly understand how you think about research. A strong SOP for me usually has four parts. Your research trajectory, where you briefly explain how you got interested in research and what kind of problems excites you now. You can mention one or two concrete research experience. Pick a couple of projects and clearly state what the problem is, what you worked on, what you specifically contributed, and what you learned technically or scientifically. It's also important to mention where things didn't work, 
where you debug, you know, or you change directions or refine your approach. These are things that can you can put in your SOP and not in your resume. And these signal research maturity. It's important to highlight what didn't work and how you learn something out of it. It's also beneficial if you tie your interests to work actually happening in Google DeepMind. For this, you can follow papers, you can attend conferences and see research directions, and also talk to past year uh, AI residents. The SOP for this uh, application is similar in spirit to PhD application, but just much crisper. They're not looking for your long-term research goals. They basically want to know that if you can meaningfully contribute in an end-to-end, -end, in an end-to-end -end fashion in a research project. Obviously, your SOP would not be read word to word. So a good rule of thumb is if someone is reading your resume or, or, or your SOP for like 45 seconds to one minute, they should have a good idea of uh, a good mental picture of how you think about research. So use this opportunity to demonstrate your research maturity. So after the screening round, you might receive an interview call and the interview process for the program um, has evolved over time. So I strongly recommend reaching out to more recent pre-docs. But the process typically has had two rounds. One of it is a machine learning round or a research round. This would be a deep dive into ML fundamentals. You can expect questions around core ML concepts and math intuition around linear algebra probability. And increasingly, you can also expect questions about LLMs and the modern architectures and techniques used to train LLMs. You can also expect uh, a deep dive into one of your projects on the resume. In this round, they care far more about your foundational understanding. So if you haven't seen a topic before, it's it's totally fine to say so. And the interviewers would be would be far more interested in how you reason uh, than just a coverage of different topics. After this, you would have a coding round. And this is a standard data structures and algorithms round. And you can think of it as medium level lead code question. There is a strong emphasis on clarity of communication and your actual coding skills. There's a lot of content online about coding prep, so I won't go deep here, but this is an important filter and it should be taken seriously. So now let me show you what my resume looked like when I applied, because I think this is what most people care about. The first thing I want to say is I did not have a top tier conference publication. I had papers under review, but these were not published yet. I had, a, I had one workshop paper and that was enough to get an interview call. So if you look at my resume uh, at the experience section, what stands out is I had end-to-end -end research projects. So at places like IBM Research and Amazon Alexa AI, I had projects that, that, were, that had novel contributions and it also led to a conference submission. And that's what the pre-doc committee cares about. Can you think about a problem and think through end-to-end um, -end and actually deliver something? And the publications, as you can see, I had one accepted workshop paper and a few papers under review. And what really mattered here was how I could talk about the project and talk about the novelty and my contribution in the interview. And that really helped. So if you don't have a NeurIPS or an ICML paper, that's okay. Another strong signal in my resume was a tangible output. If you look at my resume for each project, I had open source contributions, GitHub repos, and I had clearly demonstrated how, how you can reproduce this work. I had some artifact from each of these projects linked on the resume. And this tells the reviewer that you can actually execute research and not just talk about it. And finally, this, uh, this is a mistake I would correct if I can go back. It's, it's the fact that my resume had too many shallow projects. The first page had six to seven projects. And this is really not needed because what really matters is one or two projects that you would pick in your interview and talk about. So if I could go back, I would change this about my resume. I would not have a laundry list of all the projects I did during my undergrad. I would just explain a few of them, but really go deep and also stand behind them during my interview. Finally, each of the projects has mentions of references people who have actually seen me do research and who can vouch for me. This really helps a profile because these are researchers themselves and um, other researchers vouching for you can really help your profile stand out. And this kind of reference is, is valuable for a pre-doctoral position. 
So this is probably the most important question you have in your mind. What happens after a pre-doc? So after the fixed term pre-doc role, a lot of pre-docs go on to do PhDs, the joint top PhD programs. Others transfer and transfer internally within Google DeepMind or look for strong research positions elsewhere. You now have significantly better odds than before because you have a strong research portfolio. And either way, you leave with credibility and momentum and a lot of clarity on how to do research. And one final point is Google is not the only place that runs programs like this. There are several other labs that have um, pre-doctoral program or AI residencies. So the exact format changes year to year. So my advice is actively search for AI residencies um, and regularly check the careers page of these labs. And yeah, keep an, keep an eye out on these programs because I feel these are um, really, really uh, valuable in your career, especially if you're looking to get into research. I hope this video was useful and uh, please like and subscribe. And thanks for watching.